Let's look at the, uh, well, I'll tell you ahead of time, we know it's a failed model for um, black body radiation, or what's better known as, also known at, at the time as cavity radiation, BBR, black body radiation, or cavity radiation. Um, and the model didn't work, right? The model was reasonable, but it didn't work. And that was one of those things, turn of the century, 1900, that were not understood that uh, once Einstein and others, Planck and Einstein really, uh, were able to write down the correct description, were able to correct the cavity, the mistakes in the cavity radiation model, um, then we were able to justify a new physics or quantum mechanics. Okay, let's look at cavity radiation, the classical cavity radiation. So the model of a black body is actually a cavity with a hole in it. So this is really just like a block of wood or you know a, a big object with a big cavity in it and a hole, right, the hole there. And the model of the black body is really the hole and the cavity. It's the fact that any radiation incident on the hole, any radiation incident on the hole is going to enter the cavity. And then that radiation will bounce around in the cavity but because the hole is really small, that radiation is more likely to get absorbed by the walls than it is to bounce back out of the hole. So it's going to get absorbed, and that's the whole idea, remember, behind black body radiation. You've got to understand that the concept of a black body is simply something that absorbs all the radiation incident on it. So we might have yet another, you know, more radiation coming in, and it doesn't get out before it gets absorbed. So that's simply the model of a black body. Now, how did scientists of the time model this? They modeled it using cl um, classical statistical mechanics. So the first thing is to imagine that the atoms and molecules are masses on springs. That's supposed to be masses on springs. It's a little hard to see that. But the masses on springs are oscillating. You've probably heard of that classical model of a, a solid. We have masses on springs that are oscillating. And when we add energy to them, they just oscillate with a greater amplitude. You understand this from simple harmonic motion, that if you add energy to a simple harmonic oscillator, that it oscillates with a larger amplitude. Because remember that the energy in a simple harmonic oscillator is equal to 1 half Ka squared. 1 half K times the amplitude squared. Um, so those they will uh, oscillate with a larger amplitude as they absorb that cavity radiation. And then, if it's in thermal equilibrium, they have to emit that radiation. Now, the a standard classical model of radiation emission is what's called standing waves. We understand now, because we've studied waves a little bit, the concept of a standing wave is that these oscillators are going to emit these, this energy as standing waves. I know, I'm not asking you to really understand why that's true, because it's a classical mechanics, uh, sorry, a statistical mechanics um, tool that is often used, but I'm just asking you to understand that this is the tool that scientists used. They said that, that, the, uh, that the energy is going to be re-emitted, because remember, it's in thermal equilibrium, so if it's absorbing energy, it's also emitting, and it's going to emit as standing waves. And that's just imagine that there are waves in the cavity, right, and they're standing waves, so it might be a wave that looks like that, or another um, standing wave that can fit in the cavity, and these are just, you know, walls between which the, st the standing waves are oscillating. Another standing wave would be a standing wave like that, right, like that. I guess I could draw the other half of it. And then another standing wave. So these are what, what are called standing wave modes. One, two, three, okay. And like that, so and we can um, so so the model is is that the radiation is emitted, um, and we can approximate or, or uh, we we model it as these standing waves. And each of these standing wave modes, and this is the part that you're not going to understand, but you just got to accept as the tool that was built in statistical mechanics, is that each of these standing waves has an energy, a fixed energy, which is equal to. Kb, which is the Boltzmann constant, that has nothing to do with this K and nothing to do with Kelvin's, it's the Boltzmann constant, Kb times T. The Boltzmann constant comes up in, just as an aside, PV equals NRT, um, oops, NRT is the uh, ideal gas law, that is, if you write it in terms of atoms instead of moles, it's NKBT. So, um, the number of moles times R, that constant, is equal to the number of atoms, capital N, times Kb, the Boltzmann constant. Okay, that's where, where you might have seen the Boltzmann constant before.
So the statistical mechanics model is that each of these modes has an energy of kBt and that we add up uh, a, a large number or an, uh, of standing wave modes in order to figure out the amount of energy that's being emitted. So we just add up the energy per standing wave mode. Um, now imagine that right. This is uh, the first. The first. Uh, the the fundamental mode is uh, a long wavelength. So that is a um, that's a long a, a long wavelength. So it's a low uh, a, a small frequency, right? So the frequency of these modes is increasing, right? The frequency is increasing that in that direction. The wavelength is increasing in that direction. Yeah, of these modes. Right? Just look at the wavelength. This has a longer wavelength than this does, which has a longer wavelength than this does. Um, that means because f frequency goes as the inverse of wavelength, that that the frequency increases as we get these modes with more and more nodes. Okay, these are called standing wave modes. Standing wave modes, each of these. Okay, so the model goes like this. That the intensity versus, um, let, me, uh, let me do it versus frequency. Instead. Well, no, I can do it. I can do it versus wavelength. Never mind. Let's do it versus wavelength. Is that, this is, this is the part which, you know, just try to understand a little bit. Is that if we want to know basically the energy at this wavelength, or we might want to know the energy between some wavelength d lambda at a high wavelength. So a high wavelength, the energy, we're going to add up the energy of all the standing wave modes that have wavelength of lambda between lambda, this lambda, and this lambda, right? So, um, so, so it might be this mode plus this mode. And those are all the modes that are in that range of wavelengths. And that, and then we add, so that's 2 kT, and that's going to give us the energy. And remember, I, the intensity, power per unit area, it, it is sort of an energy, right? It's a, a power is energy per unit time, so it's energy per unit time per unit area. But anyway, it's like an energy. Now, imagine what happens, right, is that as we get to a lower wavelength, as we go to lower wavelength, the wavelengths get closer together. So for any range of wavelengths, as we get to a lower wavelength, the wavelengths get closer together. So if we're looking in a range of d lambda, we have more standing wave modes. So we have more, because every standing wave mode contributes an energy of kBt, we have more energy. So this is a simplistic model of, of the statistical mechanics model they're using. But, what, but the important thing to understand is that as we get to lower wavelengths, lower wavelengths, right, in this direction, we've got more modes that are close to each other. That means we've got more energy in any one of these d lambda bands. And that means that as we get to a wavelength of zero, that this blows up, okay? So here's what the model really looks like. Let me just go, and this is, the model is definitely more complicated than this. Here's what the model really looks like. Empirically, we're measuring the intensity per wavelength looks like this. And by the way, it is, it is not symmetrical. It's steeper um, on this side and it goes out, you know, more shallowly on the, on the right-hand side. Okay, that doesn't, that doesn't really matter. But here's what the, um, the statistical mechanical, it's classical statistical mechanical model shows. So the model is gonna be in red. The model matches really well. 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 But what happens when we get to low wavelengths? When we get to low wavelengths, the model blows up. The model blows up and the energy goes to infinity. At low wavelengths, the energy goes to infinity because all of a sudden, all these standing wave modes get really close to each other. And so we've got an infinite number of KTs in any one of these bands. Okay. So this is what's called, this is the, this, so this is the model, the classical model of the time. And this over here is, has, is given an interesting name. It's called the ultraviolet catastrophe, UV catastrophe. Cause this would be, right, if you imagine that, if you imagine this was visible and this was infrared, right, this is the ultraviolet. As we go down in wavelength, um, the frequency is actually, I just, let's, let's just say this right here, um, right, so the, wavelength goes up in that direction. The frequency goes up in that direction because frequency goes as the inverse of wavelength. And also, this is important later, is that frequency is like energy.
right? So the energy does go up. The energy of the of the wave itself goes up in that direction. But that's 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 a quantum mechanical fact. That's actually quantum mechanics. So don't worry about that right now. Um, but these are the increasing frequency, right? Ultraviolet is higher frequency light than infrared. So this might be the infrared end, and this is the ultraviolet end. So whether this is in that part of the spectrum or somewhere else in the spectrum, it, this would still be the you know the, the uh, towards the ultraviolet end of the light spectrum of the electromagnetic spectrum. The ultraviolet catastrophe, the model doesn't work. It works well um, at the higher wavelengths. It doesn't work well at the low wavelengths. 1900. This was modeled using classical statistical mechanics and the best model they could come up with. And by the way, this is a function, i is a function of lambda, and t, as we've seen, um, is equal to 2ckb, Boltzmann constant, times t over lambda to the fourth. So that's the model that the red, the red line. I guess... Um, I got it. I guess. I guess it doesn't really. So. So I did draw it slightly incorrectly. It doesn't have um, this little bump here, right? It just. It goes as lambda one over lambda to the fourth. And this is the model that kind of works. It works um, at the infrared end, and it doesn't work at the ultraviolet end to model. But it's the best model we have. The best classical model we have at the time. Okay. So how do we fix this? How do we fix, fix this? Well, Max Planck comes along and helps out. So in 1900, Max Planck, who's working to try to model black body radiation, right? It has, the problem has not been cracked yet. Um, and he assumes, just like others, that, that, the, um, that the cavity uh, absorbs and emits energy through these oscillators, right? These masses on springs. But that they're quantized oscillators. He assumes that each oscillator has an energy equal to HF, where H is called Planck's constant. Hopefully you've heard of before because Planck's constant is a very important constant, both in quantum mechanics, but it's also used um, now for the, definition, the new definition of mass. Planck's constant is used for the new definition of mass. Planck's constant is a pretty important constant, but Planck didn't think it was an important constant because what Planck said is that these oscillators had energy that came in packets of HF, and the energy of an oscillator could only be some integer number of HF. This is just a model that he was using to make it work, right? to make the curve fit. He didn't understand why, truly didn't, like, said, okay, he's going to say that the energy comes in packets. That way, if the energy comes in packets, you don't have a continuum of these, um, of these oscillators that we have to add up if we, if we say the energy can only come in certain amounts. Um, and so he said that it comes in uh, NHF where N equals an integer. And what Planck's plan was is to use this model... Um, so to, to, but to somehow he had hoped that he didn't know what H was equal to, and he had hoped that H, he could make H go to zero, so we have a continuum of energies, right? If H is a constant, then the energies are quantized because they only come in chunks. But if H goes to zero, then energies can come in any amount. Um, and so he assumed that he was going to find a way to make H go to zero, but he started with these quantized oscillators in order to not have a continuum that would make this blow up over here. Okay, <clears throat> so Planck used this model with um, H as an unknown, and the model of quantized oscillators allowed him to determine the Rayleigh Jeans law, but slightly more complicated. So you can see the similarities between to the Le the Rayleigh Jeans law. There's um, but uh, similarities, but yeah, the, there's there's definitely some differences. Um, and actually, what you what you'll find is that for as lambda goes to infinity, that this does you know Planck's law. This is called Planck's law. Planck's law. It's, it's really important in the, uh, in the uh, formation of quantum mechanics. And we find that Planck's law goes to the Rayleigh Jeans law um, as lambda gets large, as lambda gets large. Um, that actually simplifies to that. Okay, so this is Planck's law. 
And what Planck then did is he found this equation and he was able to fit this equation to the known black body curves in order to determine the value of H. And H indeed was a non-zero number, which meant that at least as far as he was concerned, he couldn't get away from this quantization of energy, that energy comes in these chunks of HF. So he found the quantity Planck's constant, which is now really prevalent in quantum mechanics. It's an important constant. Okay, so talk about what it means for an oscillator to be uh, quantized, for the energy of an oscillator to be quantized. So let's just, so, so we're pretty much done with black body radiation. Planck has solved the problem, but he doesn't really understand this idea of quantized oscillators. And it took Einstein, right, five years later in 1905, to say, yeah, actually, Planck, it, it, this isn't just a tool. This is the way physics works. And, and quantization is, uh, is a part of physics. So Planck just used it as a tool. He didn't understand it. He didn't believe in it. Whereas Einstein said, yes, this is the way it is. Okay, so let's look at what it means to have a quantized oscillator. That'll come up next.